And awesome. Ready to roll. All right. Here, let me let me get my my podcast stretches in. <laughs> the, the podcast stretch. Podcast stretch. Got to stretch that back. <laughs> I can't remember if it's like you change the right thing and you change everything, or you change one thing and you can change everything. Change the right thing, you change everything. Yeah, I like it. That's how, that's how we look at it. I, I've changed a lot, and everything <laughs> everything has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've had some kids that'll change everything for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. How's everything going? Oh man, that is a loaded question. Do you really <laughs> want to know? <laughs> um, um, yeah, of course. Um, I think the biggest lesson I'm learning in business and probably life is being resilient and learning how to handle when things don't go your way. So yeah, just everything, everything takes longer than you think. Uh, we're- Welcome to education is painful. The podcast where you will learn. This is a Toro strategic production, part of the engine media group in association with Hearst Digital Media. And I'm hoping I don't sound too much like an idiot. <laughs> I think I think the the title of the podcast is The Difficulty of Learning. So I think she picked up um, I'm not as smart as people think I am. So <laughs> that's what I'll say. All right. So, my guest today is the founder of Partner, uh, a master of big data. Uh, I think it has you have like hundreds of contributions on GitHub. Uh, great friend and part of an exclusive group uh, to have survived drinking with Dave. Is Brian Delmont. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited. Uh, so, okay. So before we get too deep into anything else, because uh, not everybody knows you, surprisingly, uh, the name, it's three words. There's a lot. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I don't know the family history of how we got a French name. Uh, But all I know is from an early age, my parents said you never uppercase the D or the L you only capitalize the M uh, and every computer system hates it. Uh, As somebody who works a lot with data, that has got to be a, a huge pain. Yeah, according to my realtor I was talking to, he was looking at some uh, property records of mine and he goes, well, according to this, your name is LeBrian Mott Day. I'm like, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, every single computer system messes it up. Um, and I, I don't think my family, I don't know if we're saying it the proper way. We just say Delamotte. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, someday I'm, I'm kind of tempted to just change my name to like something really, really simple. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I kind of like the name. What I've always been told is it means of the mountains. And, uh, you know, I was born and raised here in Boise, Idaho, and uh, always been backpacking with my family. Uh, so I love mountains. Uh, I'm going next week up, up to do a couple days out there. And uh, I just said, well, at least at least the name fits my personality, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's uh that's uh would be I guess would be a non compositional compound name. They I already yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I also discovered uh I also discovered the word poly poly polyonymous. 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 Hmm. Which means that you're known by multiple names. Ah. I guess I would fit in that now. Yeah. So, yeah. Kind of. I, I mean, when I, when I pull, uh, you know, go look at your uh, credit report, I have like five different names now because of my last name. Like, 
uh, Mr. Brian Mott, Mr. Brian Delamott, Mr. Brian Law. I mean, what? that's that's got to be loads of fun. All right. Well, let's 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 talk about uh, tell me about partner because I, I mean, I've heard a little bit about it, but um, let, me, let me hear the rest of the, the story on that. All right. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because uh, I think I tend to I'm an ideator and I just love taking ideas and uh, you just can't stop me. You know that from, from hanging out with me. Um, well, basically, um, I'm trying to help landlords and tenants at the same time. Um, I really don't like inefficiencies. In fact, I hate them and I love automation. And um, I think everyone's been there where they're applying for a rental property and they end up not getting it. So they have to go fill out a form at another property management company, shell out some more money for a background check. And you might do that a few times um, before you get your, your rental property or before you get your house, right? Um, really, you're filling out the same exact data. You're paying the same fee to do the same background check, which is usually a soft credit pull and like an eviction check or something like that. Um, and I just thought, why can't we reuse this data? I mean, so I'm a data engineer, backgrounds data before that software. And uh, my first question was just, well, why are we doing it this way? Um, you know, let's, let's reuse the applications. And uh, the other one was like, there's really no company out there. There's, there's tons of tenant screening companies out there, but there's really no tenant data company. And so these tenant screening companies, they're usually pretty old, they're pretty outdated. They're usually pulling only like one or two data sources and they usually call it good enough to just say, let's just do a credit check. Let's just do a criminal background. Let's not look at anything else. Like if they say their employment verification is this, or I mean, if they say their employment history is this, let's call that verified where it's good enough. It's self-verified. Um, same with income and even more. So the, the big problem I see is no landlords are talking to each other and there's a lot of distrust. And so I figured, well, what if I just consolidate about five or six of uh, these different data sets, you know, a little bit from the credit, the background, the eviction check, um, employment, income verification, and then actually go interview previous landlords and derive that down into a renter score. And then just let the tenant reuse that. Once they're scored, they can apply to as many properties as possible. Um, and so that's kind of the big idea. And then, um, I mean, if we can get that launched and off the ground this year, I'd be happy. And then from there, um, the name partner, everyone asks me, why did you name your, your company partner? It sounds like a dating website. <laughs> like, all right, well, you'll understand it hopefully when I explain it. Um, and so another big passion of mine is helping people. And so there's so many renters who they just – have been led to believe that they can't afford buying a house when really they can. Uh, and there's a lot of markets too, where um, it's probably cheaper to actually buy a property, but everyone just kind of believes that uh, idea of I need 20% down. I need 20% down. I can't even look at houses until I have 20% down. I bought my first house with five grand. Um, and I think I put a thousand down when I made the offer and um I, I mean, that was like a one or, or 3% kind of, uh, I guess, deal out there, right? And so what I want to do with partner is actually at the very beginning of the lease, I want to get these uh, renters and I want to ask them up front, hey, do you want to be on a growth plan? Do you want to actually get uh, partnered up with like a real estate agent, maybe a mortgage lender? And be on this, this uh, kind of the, the long path of home ownership. And then um, kind of just help people in that way, empower them. And then maybe someday they're going to actually be renting out a room or a property themselves because they were able to get it into a property earlier on and start building up equity. So you're partnering with a tenant to help guide them, mentor them to some extent and, and, kind of guide them towards, towards home ownership. So. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And then we kind of want to take it one step further too. And our idea of, of partnering is we want to be a good partner to property managers and landlords, but we also really, really want to do well by 
uh, the consumer, that's going to be the renter, the applicant. So actually having these two-sided reviews, um, because uh, if everyone's asking about your data and it's a crummy uh, landlord that's asking this, I mean, why even apply if they have one star? So we're starting to collect uh, different reviews on different landlords and property management companies and try to democratize the process. So uh, you're not only going to see a property listing, but you'll see who manages it and what their rating is and what reviews are on that. And you just know, yeah, I'm not going to give them my money. I'm going to steer clear of this. You know, that sounds like a bad deal. And uh, I'm all about fairness and equity. So really, want really, I'm just trying to, to build something like that, that kind of platform. That's my vision. Um, and then, I mean, eventually I'd really like bringing the gig economy over. And there's so many things that, that you have to do to manage a property well. Um, even if you just look, you know, pre-inspection, post-inspection, um, you know, um, different things break all the time, right? HVAC problems, um, plumbing issues, refrigerator breaks, the garage door. This happened to me last year. The garage door spring actually broke um, and my tenants couldn't get out of the garage at all. Um, that was a, that was a new one to me. Um, you know, but no one's really brought that gig economy to managing rentals. So everyone, every property management company is either keeping their own list of vendors they've used in the past and maintaining all this bookkeeping and managing, um, all these relationships. And it's very, very time consuming. Um, or you just call somebody in the yellow pages and you hope that they actually know what they're doing when they say, I can go fix this. Um, and so I just think, you know, in the right now, 2021, we got Uber, we got Uber eats, we got everything on demand. Why can't we actually bring vendors to this gig economy, start farming out jobs, um, to where maybe someone who's a full-time HVAC guy or girl, you know, um, just decides that, uh, Hey, I got some extra hours to spare. I can fix a few things. And yeah, I want to be a preferred partner on the partner network. I'll be a vendor and, uh, I'd love to take some side work as things break. And so now a property management company with partner could actually just focus on what they really do best and everything else. Uh, those vendors, they can kind of offshore to people who, really, really know their craft and partner is kind of just making all the connections and uh, automating it to infinity, really. It's kind of, kind of ends up being almost like, uh, almost like what Amazon has become, but for rental and real estate. I mean, I can see that being that, that aspect of it being useful for, for you, even if you're not really, uh, even if you're not really renting, having a vetted, trusted source to get, uh, you know, home repairs and things like that's pretty freaking valuable. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I just thought, I mean, there, there's so many ideas that I've had just thinking, okay, well, you know, if, if a, a certain repair price is above a certain amount, maybe you need the owner's approval, but if it's under a certain amount, just auto charge the account, take it out of the rent. Everyone gets paid. Everyone's happy. So, I mean, there's so much we could do and, Sadly, the space, I mean, there's, there's a lot of companies popping up. They really, really own their craft, but no one's really taken on uh, kind of the automation approach uh, in a holistic way and trying to do it for, for kind of both landlords and tenants. So I'm excited to jump in. Um, this is my second business venture. I've, I've tried starting an online coffee business right before COVID hit. Uh, I didn't get one sale <laughs> and I learned that that passion actually means something in business. You know, I, I thought I could just make a couple hundred bucks selling coffee and get my feet wet in entrepreneurship, but the passion wasn't there. And, uh, you know, I didn't take it too seriously. This, um, you know, I, I quit my job, pursued it full time. Um, I'm selling a house to make it happen. And uh, I've always been interested in real estate. I've just, I mean, I drive around just looking at open houses just because for some odd reason, I love houses. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that this one goes somewhere. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm sure I'll learn a lot. If it does, then it's going to be a heck of a ride. Yeah. So, so like a lot of, a lot of places, you're, you're your own first client. Yep, exactly. I'm like, would I, would I use this product? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, for for real. Um, so that, I mean, that kind of that's one of the questions I wanted to to ask, and uh, you know, I, I think I think of you as a as a data engineer, software engineer, big data engineer. How do you get into real estate from that? Has that always been uh, has it always been kind of in the back of your mind that uh, uh, you were going to be a Brian the landlord? Not necessarily, no. Um, I kind of always thought that I'd be sticking to my my one craft, which is like just software and data, right? But um, I have a lot of friends that kind of got me into just thinking about real estate in general. Um, and, you know, my, my uncle happens to be a real estate agent, so we do a lot of talking. Um, and then, you know, just the idea of, of building up passive income which I know everyone hates that term because nothing is truly passive. Right. But, um, <laughs> but the idea of, of leveraging money that can make me more money and build that financial independence over time. Um, that's what I'm really passionate about. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Build businesses, get into stock market, um, get into real estate. And so I'm really interested. I uh, just finances and financial technology in general, that's probably the broader uh, mm -hmm. passion that this kind of came out of. But really, I think I became a landlord on accident. Um, we were uh, looking for potentially bigger house because we knew our family was growing mm -hmm. and uh, just decided, well, why not borrow from this house to buy the house and keep the first house? And uh, I just kept running that by. Uh, these mortgage lenders and saying, well, what if I don't sell? What if I do this? And they're like, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> so I just went with it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were telling me, oh, just, just sell now, you know, just, just simplify. But um, I mean, really, I think when you look at uh, people really building wealth as they buy properties, they hold on to them for very, very long, uh, very long time, you know? So um I, and then I think from there, you know, being, being, I only have one year's worth of being a landlord, but out of that, I learned an incredible amount. And that's kind of, that sparked this idea uh, for partner. Yeah. You found, found some problems. Yep. Yep. Definitely got some horror stories there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's how you learn though, is, is through the, through the, the difficult stuff. Yeah, totally. Well, I, if I understand correctly, you just started the 75 hard challenge. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you're looking good. I have to say. Uh, so what is, what is the, uh, what is the 75 hard challenge? What, what's, how's that going? Oh, it's a, I'd say it's going really good. Um, so 75 hard Andy Frisella created this program, I think back in 2020. Um, and it's basically 75 days that are probably going to be the hardest days, uh, of your life potentially, uh, because there's no, you don't make any excuses. You don't go easy on yourself. It's called hard for a reason. So you got to do two 45 minute workouts. One has to be outdoor. Um, you got to follow a diet, you got to drink five liters of water. Um, you got to read 10 pages of nonfiction. Then, uh, you got to take a progress photo every single day and you can't have any alcohol or cheat meals. Oh, yep. <laughs> and, uh, I'm on day 10 right now. And, uh, man, it is, it is like incredibly freeing in a certain way. Um, Cause you start realizing, wow, I have been going easy on myself. Like uh, the thing that really got to me is I got through the first five days and I went great. And I got, I get to Saturday. I'm thinking uh, I'm going to sleep in, I'm going to enjoy myself. And it's like, no, this is, this is just like every other day. I need to get up. I need to go do a workout. I need to go do some reading like, and you got, kind of have that constant push. And so um already I'm just kind of seeing, wow, well, in day nine, I feel like my mental toughness is going up. What is it going to be like after 75 days? And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to just continue on and see what happens, but, uh, really got nothing but good things to say about it. 
I've seen I've seen some people have really really impressive results in this, from that challenge. I, I have not done it. Uh, hadn't even actually heard of it until a few weeks ago, but uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. What is uh, so so? It's uh, seventy five days, uh, 45, 45 minutes inside, or is, does it? One of them has to be outside, but the other one doesn't necessarily have to be inside. It's just. Yeah. Yeah, you could do two outdoor workouts if you want. Um, but uh, it's basically like if you only work 44 minutes, uh, you know, instead of 45, if you only read those nine pages, if you only drink four liters of water, you're restarting. Um, That's and, back to day one. Yep, back to day one. And uh, I think that's the motivator to take it serious, too, is you're like, well, I don't want to restart. I want to get through this, right? Yeah, fair enough. Um, and it's definitely changed my schedule, but it's definitely gotten me up out of bed earlier. Um, and I don't know if I, uh, just am crazy or, or not, but I decided, well, if I'm going to go this crazy, um, I'm going to try to do this with no caffeine. So, um, I've decided to go to cold Turkey with caffeine and just see, I'm like, how does my body operate? I don't think I've not been on caffeine since I was a kid. So, um, uh, I just want to see what happens and already I'm, I'm sleeping better. And, uh, I feel like my mind is, uh, I don't know, just more calm and collected. The anxiety kind of simmered down a little bit, but, uh, I'd say that maybe the, uh, the motivation even more to, to work on my business and get partner off the ground is dramatically increased. So even, even without the caffeine, you find your energy level and motivation is, is actually increasing. I do. As long as I'm actually planning out my day and, you know, actually schedule that time to say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I want to conquer today. And uh, I find if I wake up and I have that sense of purpose and I get those things done, then I can go to bed on time and feel pretty good about life. But if I, the, the opposite is true, you know, I guess uh, when I'm not really setting a schedule for myself, I'm waking up late you know, you start your day frantically, you just, oh, you know, I'm behind on everything and uh, trying to catch up. You don't feel like you're getting a lot done. So then you stay up late, you drink more caffeine, you try to get more done, stay up to one or two, realize, okay, now I'm super exhausted. And then you repeat all that over again. So I've finally kind of got myself back onto a schedule where um, I feel like everything is intentional and uh, just feel so much more productive that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get up early, uh, obviously not doing, not doing the uh, 75 hard, but um, I get up early and I, I have found that one, making yourself get on up and, and do something uh, just by itself is a big, I mean, that's a big way to get your day started. Well, and if you go and do that, that workout, it's almost, it's almost like the days that, that suck are end up being better because you pushed on through than if you, you know, said, Oh, well, you know, I'm just sucking today and I'm, I'm going to go back to bed or whatever. Then, you know, it's, it's almost like that, that overcoming that, that suckiness is uh, gives you a boost for the rest of the day. It does. Cause you're like, well, I just did that. And it's, Hey, it's only 8 AM. Uh, what else can I do? <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you, you start thinking, well, you know, if I I beat that, I can beat the rest of the day. Yeah. Well, and when I tell people I'm doing two workouts a day, they're thinking like, oh, you must be doing CrossFit for one and high intensity resistance training for the second workout. I'm like, no, no, no. Like it's this is still a, it's a hardcore program, but it's still scalable. And so my first workout, just like a brisk walk for 45 minutes. Uh, we got a nice path over here by a canal. I keep walking and then, um, I'm getting into some, some weightlifting and running, um, kind of for my second workout. So nothing too crazy. Um, and, but you know, something that's actually sustainable and something that I am seeing results and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start trying to ramp up those, uh, workouts as long as I don't get injured. Yeah, well, you got to watch that. But, uh, you know, the, the thing is, it, it, that happens. Um, you do need to be careful. But 
but it happens and, and you just have to take uh take uh, appropriate steps to recover and uh, you know like i've been struggling with an achilles injury for a while and uh that doesn't mean you know it means i i can't run much but it doesn't mean i can't get on a bicycle and ride <laughs> Uh, and so that's what I, you know, that's, that's what I would, would add to that is, uh, you know, even if you do get injured, there's usually, there's usually something else you can do to stay active. Uh, an injury doesn't, uh, doesn't give you license to lay up in the bed all day. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I feel too, like there's been a, lo- a couple of days where, um, you know, you, you get to the gym and you're like, oh, I'm all right. I'm still sore from the last day. I'm just going to take it easy. You know, I don't want to push myself, but you get in there and five minutes later, you're like, no, I'm pushing myself. I'm in the zone. <laughs> so it's just crazy that like showing up is the first step. And and sadly, for most of my life, uh, that's been something I've dropped the ball on, you know, not even showing up. But if you can get that down, if you can just get yourself to the gym or get yourself outside and start on that walk, then I feel like the motivation sometimes comes afterwards. Uh, so that's been another eye opener. Yeah, it's it's sometimes sometimes the most terrifying part of, of any activity that you may do is is getting yourself up off the couch to do it, um, you know, or whatever. Metaphorically speaking, um, there yeah, there's that's uh, you know I found I found when I uh, have started uh, like a new job, you know, sometimes that's that can be scary for people. Um, just starting, you know, even though I had been doing, have been doing other podcasts as a guest and, and doing another podcast as a co-host, when I decided I was going to do my own podcast, um, the first one was really scary. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I mean, I was, I'm like, I, I, sh- I know, I know what I'm doing. Uh, technically, I pretty much know what I'm doing. I know I have I have my little list of questions to go go through if I if I run out of stuff to talk about. I should be fine. But then when it comes time to actually do it, it's it's uh you still have that voice in your head that's like, "No, no, this is new, it's scary, don't do it." And uh, or, you know, or or it's going to suck or whatever. Um I mean, I, I don't think you I don't think that's something that that ever stops really especially for something that's brand new, but mm. you, uh, yeah, you definitely have to learn how to get past it. I think that's why people get sometimes get locked into only doing one thing, um, with their life or get into one routine for their life. Cause it's, mm. scary, it's scary to do something new and, uh, you know, learn, you learn to, you learn to own that and, and uh, and enjoy that, that feeling of, of, Ooh, this, this can, this is instead of saying, Oh, this could be scary. You can say, Oh, this is, this could be fun. Yeah. I think it's that mindset. Like, I don't know that uh, if, if there's a lot of uncertainty that can be really, really scary, but <clears throat> if you can build up that mental toughness to where you see it as a challenge, then you're like, bring on the uncertainty. Let's see what happens. Um, and I don't think anyone gets there overnight, but I, I'm learning, you know, leaving a, a nice job that's, uh, very, very predictable in both schedule and pay to something completely unpredictable of starting a business. There's so much uncertainty in everything. And, the, and like I told you, you know, nothing goes according to plan. Things take twice as long. Um, just people or companies who um, give you a deadline, don't make that deadline. I mean, it's just, it is kind of chaos. And so um, I think, learning how to take that on and being comfortable with the uncomfortable is definitely like a learned skill that I think every entrepreneur has to have. But I mean, even gosh, every human should probably have that start getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, finding, finding your discomfort zone is, uh, is something that we just don't do. We just don't do enough of it's, it's something we, uh, we, we have gotten sold on this idea that everything should be comfortable. Everything should have an easy button. Uh, Everything should taste good, Uh, (laughs) you know, and, and we are not the better for it. Uh, I think we've had decades of, of experience of that to see that just, you know, just making life easier doesn't, doesn't necessarily improve things that you need some, you need some challenge 
not just because it's good for you physically, but uh, it some of the least happy people in the world have have things super easy, um, and they you know there's, they you see a lot of depression with people who from the all 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 vis, you know outside visibility they look like they've got it made, um, and a lot of times that's they, they just don't have they've they've taken away all their challenges in life so yeah i I would agree with that find find yourself a discomfort zone um i heard somebody talking about uh recently talking about creating places for ritualized discomfort Mm. Uh, like uh you know years ago uh people would go on a vision quest or you know be be a, a you know an apprentice and a journeyman that was not always a pleasant experience and things like that that uh you know, give you, give you an outlet for, for that, you know, to be the discomfort zone for you. Hmm. I like that. A kind of a, a sim, like a, did you say controlled environment a little bit to where yeah. you can be uncomfortable? Yeah. yeah. But, but you're guaranteed that it's going to be uncomfortable. I think the thing is that you still have to actually seek those out though. You can't, that you don't just fall into a controlled environment and then just get uncomfortable. You have to still say, I'm choosing to be uncomfortable. It's always comes down to this, this willful choice. Yeah. You definitely have to. uh, Yeah, I I agree. I think, I think there's, there's always going to be that element of, uh, are there needs to be that element of, I chose to do this because otherwise it's basically just torture. I mean, there's a lot of things that people do uh, activities that people engage in, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's military training or, or training for a baseball team or a football team, that if you were forced to do that, if somebody was pointing guns at you and telling you you had to do it, it would basically just be, it would basically just be torture. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's a bit, there's a big difference between uh, being uncomfortable because you put yourself out there uh, and, uh, and have, a, and being told this is the way it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, thinking about it, it's like, if you just go do something to torture yourself, that doesn't sound like uh, something that's growing you. Right. But um, I don't know, like there's a lot of people who hate running, but they will actually still force themselves to go run. Um, and I think that's kind of putting you in that uncomfortable mindset uh, to grow. For some reason, I, me and you are opposite. I love running. I'm just super, super slow. <laughs> well, I'm super, super slow, but I, but I hate running. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's a good point. Uh, and I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought it up because, I mean, you can do things, you can do things that are – very uncomfortable, very, you know, definitely are a discomfort zone, but they're also Mm self-destructive. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I think, uh, I think, you know, people are, are trying to find that, trying to find that place, you know, that place of, of, you know, whether it be overcoming or, um, you know, just find that, find that feeling that you get when you're making it past something, but they're doing it in a very self-destructive way. Hmm. And uh, that, that, yeah, that's a, that's a good point uh, that, that we should probably, we should all probably think about a little bit more of, of, you know, how do I, how do I, how do I, you know, put myself into a situation where I've got the right kind of stress to make me grow Versus just putting yourself into terrible, horrible, stressful situations or, or worse things that are literally and immediately self-destructive. Yeah, I know how to do the latter one. Uh, you just say yes to everything. If you say yes to everything that somebody asks you to do or everyone, um, I feel like in a way that's kind of destructive because um you're either afraid of that confrontation and saying, no, you're afraid of letting people down. Um, but if you keep going down that path, you have no time to actually achieve your goals because you're just saying yes to everything. So 
that's another thing that I've kind of learned is like, well, I got to guard my time, you know, like um, somebody's asking me for some time here or there. Um, I really got to weigh it and say like, well, I'm probably not going to be able to do that till next month. Um, or actually that sounds like a wonderful idea, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't help with that. You know, um, but that's another thing. I don't think I I've said yes, just to uh, be destructive of myself so much as I'm so curious that I want to be part of everything. I have massive FOMO. Someone brings a good idea to me or, you know, just a new opportunity. And uh, I mean, it always grabs my attention. I just want to say, Oh yeah, let's, let's dive into it. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been there uh, myself. Yeah, but I think, you know, I think that's, that's, you know, an, an idea that I've been trying to, you know, kind of wrap my head around and consolidate it into something that is easily communicated is this idea that, that almost everything has two extremes of, you know, like there's the, the completely comfortable life versus the completely uncomfortable, awful life. And, and obviously you don't want to be all the way in one or the other. Well, I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious. Nobody wants to be completely uncomfortable, but if you had everything perfect, uh, I mean, that would get pretty old pretty quick. Mm. But the answer is not, Oh, just pick the, the median, the, the, the middle of the road. Uh, because that's, that's equally boring. And you're not like you're, you're uncomfortable half the time. And what does it get you? Like where, where would that get you? I, you know, it's not there that it's not, the answer is not aim for the middle. The The answer is that it's going to shift back and forth. And there's times when you should be comfortable and there's times when you should be uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. And then there's other times where it's going to be somewhere in between. And, you know, like you, you're saying not having time for everything. Uh, I'm struggling with time management this week because I've got so many things that are going on. Uh, and a lot of them are things that I, one way or another have brought on myself or, or taken on myself. But I also know that, that I need to put the time in, put the work in now so that I will have time to, you know, catch my breath and work on the other things that I need to do in the weeks to come. And that, so that, you know, that's not a middle of the road position. That's a, that's a very far towards one end of the spectrum position, but it's aimed at a better position, putting me in a better position in the future. That I think that's probably, it's, there's probably something to that, uh, to add to that, you know, not being self-destructive side of things. Cause you know, you need to say yes to some things. Yeah. And, and experience some different experiences and, read the 50,000 books that I have on my book list and, and so on. Well, yeah, something you just said resonated with me about like trying to make kind of tomorrow a little bit easier or to make your future a little bit better. And I kind of think, well, what if you just treat today as, you know, if I had treat it with discipline, if I treat it with intention, uh, that's going to carry over to the next day. And if I keep doing that little by little incrementally every day, is potentially going to get to the goals that you're looking for. Right. Um, and that you can't just do, you can't just wake up and just knock it out in one day and just be like, okay, I'm good. Like, no, you gotta you continue to build that, that discipline muscle. And so like, I've also just started to learn like discipline begets more discipline. So if you're starting to become disciplined in just one area of your life, then it often spills over to other areas and then you're more productive and you're getting more things done and uh, hopefully that means you're, you're reaching your goals and that future becomes brighter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and it's not even necessarily that you're, you know, it's not even necessarily that you're making things easier in the future. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you put the work in now, you know, you, I mean, I guess, I guess you could say that's easier, but. Yeah. Or maybe another word would be like clearer. Maybe the sure, yeah, future's clear. more clear. Right. Clarity and, and just, uh, you know, not, uh, not easy in the sense of, of taking it easy and, and relaxing, but easy in the sense of 
I put the work in up front. So now I don't have to go back and, and try to catch up and, and struggle, you know, so I'm, I'm doing a little bit of extra work now so that I have a little bit of time to a little bit of time so that if I want to say yes to something that I wouldn't have had time for otherwise in the future that I will, I'll have that. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of feel like fitness actually kind of does uh, fit into that category a little bit because um, I've just learned that for me, I've been kind of really out of shape for a lot of my adult life and uh, just realized you know, thinking back 10 years ago when it was actually easy to wake up and just jump out of bed. And, uh, when you just, you could spend, you know, you could stay up all night and yeah. code to get four hours of sleep, get back up, repeat a couple of times. And, uh, I'm just thinking, I'm not, not that I want that lifestyle again. I don't want to stay up till 4am coding, but, um, just thinking like, well, you know, the difference between like the, having that fit lifestyle and having a healthy body and an unfit or unhealthy body actually does carry over to your work. And so when you're eating healthy and when you're exercising, like for me, that's when I actually do see the best work. And when I do have more energy. And so right now my schedule's all over the place. I got two young kids, you know, I got crazy meetings. I'm working with other people um, who are working on partner part-time with me. And so we're meeting at, you know, 8.30 tonight, you know, just um, chatting over some different things. So everything's all over the place. And, you know, I've always noticed like getting to the uh, evening time, you know, seven and nine o'clock kind of going brain dead. But, you know, when I start building that mental toughness, and I start eating healthy, I start working out, um, I start getting healthy again. I feel like, oh, wait, seven o'clock, it's eight o'clock, it's nine o'clock. I'm still all mentally here. I'm still feeling good. I'm still fired up. I'm still motivated. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just, just that in itself is, is a huge payoff. Like, and I even, this is crazy too, but I was talking to another buddy uh, who works at Micron and I said, well, yeah, well, you know, what's your team do to kind of, I don't know, keep their edge. And he goes, I, the best workers that I have, uh, either the best analysts or engineers they actually fast for a few times uh, throughout the week. One one guy out there, I guess, is fasting. You know, for a few a few uh, days wow. all at once. And uh, he asked this individual. He says, um, "Isn't it really hard to concentrate and do your work?" And he goes, "No, this is actually when I perform my best." And that was to me was just an eye opener. I think that got me on the the train of like, wow, like actually taking care of me will result in better work and higher performance. And I need to take my health serious. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think there's a sweet spot of, I mean, if you think about people for most, most of human history, regardless of how you define that most of human history, people were not in a state of plenty of food everywhere. And I, I definitely would agree that there's a sweet spot of between being hungry and, you know, I think everybody, I, I know after a few hours of, of, uh, of, of going hungry, uh, you know, it gets to be dinner time and I start getting hangry. Yeah. <laughs> but if you break through that and I have, I've done it a few times, if you break through that and, you know, go on for, you know, 24 or 48 or, or you know, a, a two or three days, I think, you definitely see a difference. Like you can, you can almost feel it when your body said, kind of switches over and says, Oh, okay, this is how it's going to be. And, uh, and, and, but I think you, I think you get a, a, a burst of, uh, you know, kind of creative and analytic energy, physical energy as well. That is, that is your body's way of being ready for, okay, well, we're hungry. We're really getting hungry now. It's time to go, it's time to go collect some food, whether that be, you know, hunting or gathering or going to work at a software company. Uh, but it definitely, I, I would, uh, I don't have any evidence for that, but I think it's uh, other than, other than my own experience and what other people have told me. It'll definitely be something to, to look into is whether there's a, a legitimate uh, 
you know, evidence for a fasting boost. Of course, I'm also seeing people go to the extreme and, and, you know, you do, you do start to run down after a while, but yeah, part of this, part of what you're describing there sounds like getting old. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. The, the thing is, I, I can't always be old because my dad, he's turning 70 here in a couple weeks and he is still beating me up these mountains in Idaho. He's still <laughs> snowboarding at seven years old. Uh, he's still going on mountain bike rides and he's just an overall beast and uh, nothing's slowing him down. And so I'm just like, well, I think that's my first marker is <laughs> I got to catch up to my seven year old dad uh, going up these mountains. Um uh, I've got a picture of my dad snowboarding, even even at thirty. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I I think you know you're uh, you're talking about uh, your fitness, physical fitness, giving you a boost. I I definitely think, especially as you get older, you know, talking about uh, being able to stay up all night and and party, stay up all night and work, and, and recover quickly from that. You know, the, the older you get, the harder it does. It just does. It gets harder. But if you've built up some, you know, if you've built up some fitness, built up some some energy reserves there, then when you do need to do that, uh, you know, I had I've had a couple of late nights recently that I was a little seeing You know, that's this could be bad. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, because I have built up some reserve, I was able to, to go to keep going and, and stay alert longer and, and, uh, and recover a little better. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, once you get past 30 something, it's, it gets harder and harder. And therefore that, you know, getting and maintaining a, a level of uh, physical readiness becomes more and more important as a result of that. So, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And I think for me, it's not so much like, trying to get out of sleeping anymore and saying, Oh, I just, I just want to stay up and only get six hours of sleep and survive. It's like, no, what I really, I still want eight hours of sleep or even seven good ones. Right. But I want to wake up, live my life of intention until, you know, nine, 10 PM. I, and I put my head down on my, my bed, on my pillow. And I feel good about what I accomplished that day and that I was intentional all those hours. Maybe even those, those hours, had intentional fun, intentional rest. Um, but I think even those have purpose behind them. Right. But I mean, if you're going, if every single day you're in a, a zombie haze, you know, drinking coffee cup after coffee cup, you know, struggling to stay alive in your zoom meeting because it's so, <laughs> it's either so dang boring or you're so tired and you know, your blood sugar is going up and down because you're eating healthy and just, all of that, you know, compounded on each other. I mean, that's what I'm trying to talk about is like ditch that, get healthy and uh, start living your life with intention and, uh, and push yourself. Right. I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm more of that kind of guy. Like if someone says I can't do it, I'm going to be like, no, I'm going to do it. Uh, (laughs) So someone, someone was telling me I I really wanted to do this uh, half marathon here called Roby Creek. And back in 2019, I had a friend that was training for it and uh, I was supposed to train for it. I had best intentions to train for it. And someone was telling me, and I I was even heavier than I am now, you know, Oh, I wouldn't run that. That's a lot of uphill and then a lot of downhill. That's going to be bad on your knees, you know? And I'm like, no, I want to do it. (laughs) But uh, I didn't train that. That was like the beginning of the year. And I had that attitude, like, I'm going to go do it. So then life got in the way. I didn't train. I didn't run. And uh, race day comes and I'm like, I don't know if I should do this. Uh, And I was just paralyzed with this fear of, of, you know, what do I do? And, you know, can I really do this without training? And then that attitude, finally, just going through that analysis paralysis, like two hours before the race, I'm thinking, well, why not do it anyway? Right. (laughs) So we drive down there. I run the race, I, you know, I finish it. uh, I, and that's all I really cared to me at that point was just finishing it, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, if if someone says don't do that because of X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, well, no, I see other people doing it. Why can't I do that? I think that's another thing 
why I started a business. So I'm like, well, it's, I don't think I'm better than anyone, but if there's so many other people starting businesses, why can't I do that? So I, I kind of like to live my life of, you know, why can't I be a runner? Why can't I go to a half marathon, even if it's the lowest time on the board or something, you know, um, just things like that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you on that. That's, that's, yeah, I, I always think, you know, people who are, people who are, let's call them naysayers that, uh, oh, you can't do that. Uh, I always wonder, like, do you, did you do it? Are you doing it? Because uh, just because you're not doing it doesn't mean I'm not doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, okay, I get it that you, you don't think you can do it, but your, your limitations don't have to apply to me. Yeah. Like don't push your limitations onto me yeah, basically. Yeah. And you know, that's, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't tell people to don't train for things but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but just, because you, just because you didn't doesn't mean you can't do it. it just means you can't, you may not make the time that you wanted. You may not, uh, you know, you may not be able to, like run a whole thing the whole time or whatever, but, uh, but yeah, you should, should totally do stuff. That's, uh, that's a little outside your, a little outside your zone. And like you, I think, uh, the more somebody tells you that's, you can't do that. That's, that's usually a good sign that, uh, that, yeah, you probably can and you probably should. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, within, within limits, but, uh, yeah, that and I think like I think the other motivator was I mean the lesson is definitely not go go sign up for something hard, don't do anything and then show up the last minute. That's not the lesson, right? But I think the lesson is if you committed to something even if you didn't do it the right way, like still own up to that commitment that you made. And so I was like, well, "You know what? I told my friend I was going to run this, and so I better run it." And, uh, you know, if I die, there's first aid stations over there. It'll be okay. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, half marathons a good distance. So, uh, you know, so you, you mentioned, you mentioned diet. And so, uh, I hope this doesn't uh, mess up your diet to, to get you thinking about this. <laughs> Where is the, uh, where's the best foe that you've, uh, discovered? Oh my gosh. Um, it's definitely Fo Saigon in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I want to say, what, what is that town? Is that Glen Burnie up there? Yeah, I think it was, I think that was close to Glen Burnie. Glen Burnie. Yeah. Um, I think nothing's top that I've, I came back to Idaho and I've been to every faux place over here and, um, Fo or fa, however you say it, right? But um, nothing compares to that. And then I've been to some places here, and it was lukewarm. And I'm like, "You call this fa? What are you doing?" <laughs> uh, so I have definitely tried to chase uh, that same thing that I found uh, over there on the East Coast. Have you have you had any any more uh, any more uh, unusual foods that you've had the opportunity to try since then? Ooh. Um. So, so while you're thinking about that, I'll just yeah. explain that uh, that when uh, you know somewhere along the, the line, when when we were you know had met and were you know having dinner and so on, you were saying that you just were trying all these different foods at different places just to get the experience, just to see what they're like. Um which I thought was brilliant, a uh, great way to do. And I did something a little less, a little less, uh, a little less organized, but I had done something years ago, similar. And still a lot of times we'll, uh, we'll try something weird just to, just to try it. But, uh, but I thought that, I thought that was a great uh, way for somebody to, you know, just experience the world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I really love food. And so I usually will try anything. <laughs> um, I guess I'm not a picky eater. Um, 
I think that recently I haven't been trying so much new food back here in my hometown, but um, I've been just trying to do a lot more grilling and a lot more things with spices. So um, my father-in-law, he makes probably the best salsa um, mm. I've ever had. And it's the spiciest. And uh, I tried tried making my own and didn't turn out good. It was hot, but yeah, I mean, uh, this guy, he, he's, he makes his normal salsa and he goes, all right, here's the regular batch. Here's the Brian batch for me and you. And there's like all these extra <laughs> habanero pieces that are just clearly shown in there all shredded up. And so I've been having that and getting ready for uh pie hole. Uh, that that's a pizza place here or no, I don't know. I don't even know anymore. (laughs) Not pie hole, but it's uh, flying pie pizza. There we go. Um, They have a triple habanero pizza in August. So I don't do it every year, but every couple of years I like getting that. And uh, I don't know if that's, that's uh, the growth mindset or torture because it's, it's so good, (laughs) but but it is so painful (laughs) eating that food. Um, but it's also uncomfortable. So yeah, I, I hear you. We got we got hold of some good. Uh, we got got hold of some good ghost peppers and scorpion peppers at a farmer's market a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, I, I have to admit I could not finish the whole pepper. Yeah. Uh, just we so we roasted them on the grill, and uh, like I, you know, chopped off a little piece of the pepper and uh, kind of chopped it up in my whatever it was we were having fish tacos is what we were having and it was great like it was really good but uh it didn't take much hmm yeah um yeah i think and then it's weird because every single pepper is different right i mean you can get jalapeno poppers over here and they're not even spicy and then you go get another batch and they're hotter than the habaneros you know you're just like what just happened um <laughs> something that was kind of a new experience for me that I just had to do was go get one of those tomahawk steaks. Have you seen those? Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think I saw your post where you had those on your grill. Yep. <laughs> so that was last Friday and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I uh, just followed a recipe, but I, I thought oh, I'm going to buy three of these because, you know, I'm having maybe six people total. We can split them in half. Um, but those things were so massive. I think, uh, one, one of those steaks fed six people is pretty insane. Yeah, they're, they're, they're big for sure. All right. Um, I, I wanted, I wanted to ask you about a couple of other things, but we may just, we may just have to do a part two. (laughs) All right. Uh, but I, I do have a couple other questions to, to throw in there. One um, is uh, you mentioned grilling. Uh, how does the how how well does microwave popcorn work on a grill? Ooh, I don't think it works that well. <laughs> you tried that though, right? Well, I want to. I, I think I did last year, yeah. and it yeah. didn't work too well. I tried roasting my coffee beans on a Traeger as well. Okay. Um, I tried to, I was thinking I'm going to get these coffee beans infused with smoke and this yeah. awesome wood taste. Right. And uh, they just turned into normal coffee beans. So I was very disappointed with that. Yeah. It worked, I, though it worked. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, the process of coffee to, uh, to have much, much to say on that other than that. Uh, that uh, I, I like a good uh, I like a good infused coffee or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the uh, there's a there's one here in Texas called uh, Whiskey Morning Coffee hmm. that, uh, that roasts their coffee with somehow with uh, with bourbon barrels, and it has a really good s- smell out of the bag, and then it has a really good you know really good flavor in the coffee. Uh, which is another one of those fascinating things, how, how much the smell of coffee and the taste of coffee are not the same. Hmm. Uh, that's always been an, an odd one to me. But so 
if you if you could send, I'm trying to make this a, a standard question that I do, but if you could send a, a Twitter length message to yourself at at the age of let's say say 15 or 25, you know, or both, uh, if you could send a Twitter length message to yourself, uh, just a short message to yourself, what what would you what would that message be and and why? Is that only like 140 characters? Um, I'll, I'll give you the, the 200. <laughs> okay. Oh man. Um, I want to say there'd be something I could do in a computer science approach to compact as much data as I could in those 280 characters. That could be a very, very long message of everything I need to know, but, uh, that's probably not going to work. So, um, I think I would just pick something like, you know, either try harder earlier on, (laughs) like, because it took me a while, I think, to get really serious about education. And, uh, you know, I think I, I, like, when I went back to college, or when I initially started, I just wasn't uh, mentally prepared to to really give it my all. So um, I think something of the lines of like, you know, push harder, try harder, like, take take things serious, take your education serious earlier on. Um, But uh, even more than that, I think if I could, if I could do a a semicolon or or period and and say more things, I would say um, probably not to worry so much. I think um, there's just always been in my mind um, probably worrying too much about um, what others think or, um, you know, what if this, what if that, just like maybe uh, doing that analysis paralysis. So I'd be like, just something along the lines of, you know, don't overcomplicate things and, you know, don't worry about what other people are thinking and just go after what you want to do. And I think I'm doing that now. I just think it uh, took a little bit longer than, than uh, maybe it should have. I don't know. I don't, I don't regret anything, but yeah, that would be helpful uh, to know that earlier. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I guess maybe a follow-up question I should ask, uh, start asking people for that is, is would you have listened? Mm. Uh, I think there's some things that I should have told myself that uh, I probably wouldn't have listened. Yeah. Um, that's it. I, I don't know. I, part of me wants to say, wow, future Brian, I better listen to this. But yeah, the other you, one would be like, who's this old guy trying to tell me something to do? Like, come on. But, then, but we have that, right? We have we have parents and grandparents and yeah. mentors who tell us things that we don't listen to. So, I mean, but do do you respect your future self? That's the question. Or do would would you have when you were uh, in your, your teenage years? Would, I think would me at 15 look at me at 50 and say, what a loser. <laughs> right, right or wrongly. What's that? Right, right, rightly or wrongly, not. not yeah. And that's they're ju- I'm not saying that the 15 year old's judgment is correct, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so I, I, you know, maybe I can look to my son to find that out. So <laughs> oh yeah, I think, uh, and that's what I'm. I'm constantly wondering about is uh, I was thinking about doing like a video vlog for my son because he just turned uh my oldest son just turned three years old uh everett um yeah that was just yesterday i'm like i don't know time is weird when you don't when your schedule's all over the place but we took the day off we went to to wahoos we played all sorts of fun games i'm thinking man i'd love to just do like a video blog and tell him what i'm thinking and what i'm going through when he's three years old so that when he is an adult and I'm telling them, well, man, I'm, uh, you know, I really just love our moments of hanging out. Um, I'm trying to build a business. Uh, we got this crazy remodel going of the old house. You know, I don't know if you remember that. It'd just be so cool to be, to, to, for him to look back and kind of see the, you know, the younger dad and what, what he was up to when he, he was a young child, you know? So, um, I don't know kind of kind of related to that whole you know, looking into the future and past but yeah. 
yeah, I, that's, I mean, that's essentially where it's going with that. But, uh, well, I, I think we've probably got enough left for, uh, for a volume two, <laughs> but, um, right. but I've really appreciated you uh, spending the time with me and, uh, always appreciate our conversations. Do you, uh, so the, uh, the startup is partner P A R T N Y. Yep. Yeah, part. I just say partner with a Y. It yep. was the <laughs> it was the only domain that was uh, not fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> that's that's definitely one of the best reasons for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I what I was stuck on partner, and uh, I reached out. I, I thought, what about partner without the e in there? Just P A R T N R. I reach out, and uh, they're like. The minimum bid is $50,000. Please come back to us when you have acquired the funds. I'm like, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> Dropping the letter thing is so 2000 teens anyway. Yeah, yeah. But partner.com, that's actually a, a dating multinational dating website or something like that. So I'm like, well, I'm, I don't think I can buy them out yet. Hey, maybe you could Maybe you could call it like, it's like a dating app, but for people and rental properties. Yeah, I kind of, it's like tenant matchmaking a little bit. I've said that. Another person phrased it as uh, the zip recruiter of <laughs> rentals. Yeah, I, I, you're, you're, I think you're probably going to uh, a better place than zip recruiter, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing against zip recruiter, but, uh, but yeah, thanks so much for coming in, our, uh, coming on the Zoom, and uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime in person your place or mine. And uh, man, thanks a lot. I've really enjoyed it. Hey, thank you, Jonas. It's always a pleasure talking with you and uh, just honored to be on your show. And uh, yeah, I'd love to do a follow-up. I'll either have a success story for you or I'll have a ton of lessons of my failures for this startup. So I'll have, I'll be happy to share either way. That would be awesome. I would love that. break no i don't know how do you do it <laughs> uh, yeah well rea the reality is that i try to leave just a little you're locking up yes sir locking it up there's no one here you. okay <laughs> well, it may maybe it'll cool off in here then <laughs> yeah everybody's leaving the studio yeah. uh, well thanks for having me and uh making the time for me i feel cool. Pretty cool being on two podcasts within two weeks. For the, uh, I, I would I would love to, to talk with you uh, about uh, religion again sometime because I just think you just have such a cool way of looking at it. Thanks. To be to be you know technically technically demographically in what a lot of people would call one of a very intolerant position and and you're not and i think you're more representative of of people I'm, i should save this for the for the podcast 